holy cow, you cannot ask for better weather here in Moab. It's sunny, it's warm, it's not too hot yet. It's still early in the season, it's April. But we're just north of town at the Mill Creek Dinosaur Loop. And there's a bunch of really interesting stuff to talk to you guys about today. I'm gonna to show you the dinosaur bones in the Morrison Fluvial Channel back there. That's what 90% of people come here to do. Uh, the other 10% are probably just mountain biking and off-roading. There's a whole story to be told here that unfortunately we don't have time. I can't get into it because I'm not a structural geologist, but let me just summarize briefly that we're right on the trace of the Moab Fault, that big north-south trending fault that goes throughout the entire valley and creates the crazy landscape you see here. Now, I'm not a structural geologist, so I don't really know what I'm talking about, and there's a million and one YouTube videos on the Moab Fault that are done better than anything I could do. So you can go out and find them on your own. I'm not going to do that. Why the Moab Fault's important to us here is a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, you see all the green vegetation below me. This is a desert, what's going on? There's actually even some water down there. I saw a turtle in a pond back up the road when I was coming. What is up with that? It's because of the Moab Fault. It creates a fluid flow barrier and water, melt water, gets trapped when moving through the ground against the trace of the fault and it kind of flows along it, creating this little riparian corridor, this little stream. So it's got standing water um, even during the dry part of the year, there's water just underground. In the cool part of the year, like now, it's actually standing water. And I guess it stays long enough for turtles to live here. Like, who knew? So the structural geology is really important for fluid flow. That translates, of course, if you're a, you know, oil and gas exploration person or looking for water or, or these sorts of things. Fluid flow is definitely affected by faults. Here's prime evidence of that. The second thing that's interesting is why is the Morris information behind me sitting alongside and underneath some of the Entrada sandstone. Back up the valley, you'll see little spires of Entrada sandstone. Um, there are some towers of the Entrada that have eroded in a really, you know, unique and fashionable way. Um, everybody around here names things. So these guys have been named uh, the Determination Towers. And behind them is this thing that's called Big Mesa. So you can see that now. That's because the fault has pushed all that material up relative to the Morris information here. So the fault's got a lot of impact on the stuff we're seeing right in front of us. That's why I figured I'd better talk about it a little bit. Now nobody can get on me for saying, oh, you went to Moab, didn't talk about the fault. I just did. More importantly, we're here to look at some dinosaur bones. Let's quit wasting our time and go do it. Come on. You know, so as we're walking over to the site, I thought we'd talk a little bit about doing science out here. Uh, there's a lot of signs that the BLM has put up, and a lot of museums have put a lot of thought into this. And that's great. We're going to test those signs, test the hypotheses that they propose by looking at the rocks, looking at the fossils, and doing some of our own science and questioning and answering. So the BLM signs tell us that these dinosaurs died when a large river swept them up during the flood stage, drowned them, and buried them forever. In fact, Here's a sign telling us about a bone. There's the bone in the cliff. That's pretty cool. How accurate is that story? Well, we can test three ideas. Number one, you know, is the river big enough to have allowed these dinosaurs to number one, swim across, and number two, drown them? Um, the illustration shows a really big river with a lot of elephant-sized dinosaurs drowning in it. So number one, is the river big enough? Number two, what's the state of preservation of the bones? Does it indicate animals that were swept away, buried, and decomposed under a bunch of sediment and stayed put? Um, and number three, what do the sediments tell us? Do they suggest that the river was flashy discharging like that, where you had these big floods, deep waters, um, and then went back to normal? So let's test these three ideas. Was it a big river? Did it flood occasionally? And did it bury these animals in place? All right, so first things first, how big is the river? Um, you can generally get an estimate of how deep a river is by the height of its bars. It makes sense because when a river is flowing, it's depositing sediment. And during flood stage, when it's the highest, it's building out a bar just under that flowing water. That's why the bars emerge during, during the low water period. Um, so, you know, looking at the height of a bar gives you a good estimate of how deep the river channel was. Look at this sandstone body behind me, I gotta tell you, it's not very tall. 
Um, at its thickest, we're looking at maybe nine or 10 feet. There's the thickest part of the body. As deceptive as that existence for me. Yeah, it looks about maybe eight or nine feet. So not a super tall bar in this river. That might suggest that the river was not very deep. Oh man, we're in luck now. Right behind me is these beautiful big crossbeds, fluvial crossbeds, um, indicating flow pretty much that way. So that's what, like east, maybe a little bit southeast. Um, consistent with what we know about the Morris information, it was building from west to east. That four set, it's a very coarse grain one too. It's very gravelly, conglomeratic. It's about maybe a foot and a half, I might even say two feet tall. Just for fun, you can estimate flow depth by taking the height of a preserved bed like that, a preserved cross bed, multiply it by anywhere from six to 10. People have suggested, you know, a range in there. Just for fun, let's take 10. Let's make it maximum. So if it's two feet, that says a maximum flow depth could have been about 20 feet. All right, if it's closer to six feet, well, or if it's closer to about six times, we're looking more at about 12 feet. So 12 to 20 feet of flow depth, that's pretty good. Shallow bars, short bars indicating shallow depth, but the cross bedding suggests higher flow depths. So, okay, not out of the possibility that it was flooding higher than the backs of the dinosaurs. Hmm, quantitative sedimentology to the rescue. Yeah, this stuff's all very, very coarse grained. You can probably see the granules from there. Um, these things are like the size of grapes. There's big pebbles in that. So we've got a really high energy system, really high energy fluvial channel. Um, take a look at this in this block. This is like really, really coarse grained stuff. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous cross beds. Look at that, just, I mean, absolutely textbook. Um, they're all pointing that way. That's northeast. Again, consistent with what we know about the Mars information flowing east, northeast from the Mogian Highlands and the Severe to the southwest. More beautiful cross beds in the rock right in front of me. I mean, just absolutely textbook versions of cross beds. If you ever want to take a sedimentology class out to show them some cross beds, I highly recommend the Mill Creek Dinosaur Trail. This is a great example of a scour behind me, of a fluvial scour. Now, some people are tempted to say that's a channel scour, uh, but in a braided system or a highly energetic fluvial system, bars and little smaller scale scours chomp into each other all the time without it being a new channel belt or a new channel body. It's a very, very coarse grain sediment on top of the scour compared to the finer grain material below. So instead of saying it's a separate channel or channel body, I would be tempted to say it's probably definitely a depositional event separate from the one below, but it might just be another bar slicing into and migrating partly over an older bar. That's what happens during floods. Um, we see it in modern systems all the time. So don't be fooled thinking that a scour always means a new channel belt. It might actually just be another bar um, incising and moving on top of a previously deposited one. And if this is a braided stream, like it very well might be, uh, you would expect exactly this kind of relationship. Yowza, okay. We're in front of a bar. If it's a single bar, it's about maybe 15 or 20 feet tall. So it's that height that we're needing to make this a river big enough to drown an animal. All right, so the bar itself is about 15, 20 feet. Our calculations based on the height of the four sets suggested somewhere around 20 feet maximum flow depth. And it's got very coarse grain. So it's got depth, it's got very high energy. And in this hole behind me is a log. That's a cross section of a tree. There are some really big trees. It makes sense. There's big dinosaurs. They had to have been eating something big. There's a big tree. Um, I've seen people argue that in the Morris information, there's not really uh, large trees, uh, not big forests. There's mostly fern and savannas. Well, there's a big tree and it came from somewhere. Most likely it got transported during the river flood stage when just like in a modern system during floods, all the down trees and tree limbs and bank collapse causes these things to fall into the channel. They get swept along until they snag somewhere and then they get preserved. Um, I showed you examples of that in the Colorado River flood video. 
So here's a big tree trunk. There's isolated dinosaur bones. It's a big fluvial bar with high energy. So far, so good. The story's holding up. There's one last thing to consider, and that's the preservation of the bones. Okay, selfie stick to the rescue again. Here are some cross sections of bones, of long bones, from at least two different species uh, or genera of dinosaurs. One is an Allosaurus, according to the BLM sign. The other is Camptosaurus, which is an herbivore, an ornithischian. But you can see there's a couple of them here, um, not related to each other, not from the same animals, a mixture of different taxa jumbled together. All right, we saw something similar to this in the Utah raptor quarry where the bones were taken apart, disarticulated, and just jumbled up. In this case, this is a very coarse grained sand. There's gravel, conglomerates, there's pebbles, and very large dinosaur bones. So there's something going on here beyond just normal fluvial uh, burying of a carcass. These things were taken apart prior to burial and accumulation. Okay, yeah, so filling in our story of how the bones got here. Here's another one, here's a long bone, um, preserved lengthwise, kind of oriented in the same direction as the current, sort of east-northeast. Uh, here's a vertebra, a spinal bone. So we've got vertebrae, we got long bones. Over there, we just saw at least two different animals mixed and matched. We saw a Camptosaurus and an Allosaurus. This is probably some kind of sauropod, not very big. Um, so we've got at least three different species or genera or taxa of animals mixed and matched. None of these are articulated. So let's think about that for a second. If an animal's passing through, starts to cross a big river in flood, drowns, gets carried away and gets buried in sand, it should be in pretty good shape. And we have fossils like that from the Cretaceous in Wyoming, um, complete with skin on them. They're hadrosaur mummies. They've been found in Alberta, they've been found in Wyoming, they've been found all over the place. Uh, there's even sauropods like this one found in northern Wyoming with skin still on them because they were preserved shortly after they died. These things are all isolated bones and they're found in different layers. There's one down here, there's one up there, there's some higher up. So we've got different depositional events over time transporting bones and pebbles and cobbles and rocks at different times, mixing and matching them at different times. To me, this sounds a lot more like um, episodic fluvial transport of disarticulated carcasses that were laying around either in the channel or on the floodplain. Um, just like logs get swept up and transported, so would dinosaur bones. Um, so maybe the story here is not as dramatic as the sign tells us. It's equally interesting. Um, we still had a big channel based on the bar height and the calculations from the dunes, you know, it's flowing about 20 feet deep minimum. That's pretty good size for a semi-arid system. Generally, it's lower water, probably braided, um, but during a big flood, it got huge. During those big floods, it probably swept all kinds of stuff from the floodplain and the bars where the animals died and got scavenged, swept it up, jumbled it in with all the class and rocks and deposited them here. You think there was no boulders back then, but there were big trees, there were big dinosaur bones, and they behaved like clasps. So it's an interesting story, and we teased it out by looking at the sedimentology, the stratigraphy, and the preservation of the bones. It's maybe not as dramatic as the signs imply, but you know, that's okay. It's still an interesting tale to be told. The signs at least get the gears going in your head, and I saw at least a couple of kids out here with their parents looking at dinosaur bones. What more can you ask for, right? I mean, getting people thinking about science is what we should all be kind of striving to do a little bit more of. Thanks for joining me on this adventure. It's been a blast. I hope you learned something. I hope you had a good time. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again.